Just over a year ago, I dipped my toes into the world of macOS, giving you my brief first impressions. But as made clear by the comments, I needed to dig deeper. So here it is. For the past 30 days, I've been running an experiment. A macOS experiment. I've been using the M1 Pro MacBook Pro as my daily driver. Some of my recent videos were produced on this very machine. So get ready as we explore the things I liked, the things I didn't, and the things I really, really didn't didn't like, comparing it directly to my trusted companion, this 16-inch laptop running Fedora 38. And let me be completely transparent, this journey was not all sunshine and rainbows, and I am really, really glad to be back on Linux. Just like I'm really, really glad to tell you about today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by ProtonMail, the private and secure email service based in Switzerland that protects your privacy by using end-to-end -end and zero-access encryption. A lot of email services like Gmail make their money by collecting all the data they can about you, including your emails and your inbox activity, so they can target you with ads. With ProtonMail, though, your emails belong to you. Your inbox is clear of trackers, ads, spam, phishing, and it has all the features you would expect to manage your email, your calendar, and more. And they also support hardware security keys, biometric authentication, sender verification, and a bunch of other security features. And if you want to switch, it's actually very easy. Proton has a tool to help you switch from Gmail called Easy Switch. It will let you import all your Gmail contacts, calendars, and emails to your new Proton Mail account. It will also automatically forward all your future emails from Gmail to your Proton inbox, and everything will be protected with Proton's encryption and tracking protections. Plus, Proton Mail is free forever and gives you a VPN, calendar, and cloud storage at the same time as your email address. So you can import everything and try that at no cost. And you can upgrade whenever you want to get more storage. So if you're tired of being tracked even in your inbox, or if you just want to move to a secure and private email service, Click the link in the description below and give Proton Mail a shot. So let's start with macOS. Right out the gate, no drag and drop window tiling quickly became the biggest problem I had. I resorted to a third party app called Rectangle, which sort of works, but its limitations became clear very quickly. For example, resizing windows when they're side by side, that's not happening. And the native macOS styling features are subpar, requiring you to click the small green button and forcing you to have windows side by side at all times. Plus, they're full screen, which isn't great either. The dock, disappointingly, also cannot minimize apps on click. I found a workaround by double clicking on the window border, but then maximizing became a problem. And the green button, it tosses everything into full screen mode. It might work on smaller screens, but on a desktop or even a 16-inch laptop like the one I have, it's more of a hindrance, especially since it hides the global menu bar, even though on this laptop it could be displayed, because the whole area where it's supposed to be is just blacked out for some reason. Still, the silver lining is the global menu. It is very well executed, something I wish Linux supported better. KDE offers it, but not every app plays nicely, and if you mix and match between GNOME and KDE apps, some will have a menu, some won't, some packaging formats don't work with it, and Firefox and LibreOffice are also generally not doable unless you get a specific patched version. Now, file management? That's another story. No cut and paste for files and folders in the file manager, and this left me very confused. Why isn't this a thing? Does Apple think that I'm too dumb to cut and paste a file? I am dumb, but not that dumb. Also, dragging files to other folders or even to an open app? That's painfully slow. Why do I have to wait for this to actually do anything? Also, click to focus is the worst. I have to double click in my notes app to be able to paste or type anything in it when I have two windows side by side. Installing apps was a learning curve. The app store seemed to not have any of my essentials, Resolve, Firefox, GIMP, OBS, Steam, among others. Initially, the process of downloading disk images and persuading the OS to accept new apps 
was irritating, but with time, I adapted and it's okay now. Of course, a fully stocked and functional app store is always a better experience than hunting online and downloading DMGs like a caveman. Now, virtual desktops on macOS work decently. Gestures are handy, but GNOME, I would say, does it better. Accessing and creating new virtual desktops felt clumsy and took more steps than necessary. Why do I have to open the multitasking view, then put my cursor in the top part of the screen to reveal workspaces, and then click the plus button on the right to create a new virtual desktop? In GNOME, I just swipe three fingers to the left and I automatically have a new desktop where I can open apps and make everything work. Managing windows and desktops generally felt like the system is designed for monotasking instead of multitasking, and it was a pain to be productive on macOS. Now, a small gripe, but a significant one, I can't double tap and hold to drag a window or resize it. I must physically click, and this was a pain to adjust to. However, I have to commend macOS for its font rendering, it is superb, especially when compared to Linux, where it is not possible, as far as I know, to get the same smooth result. Spotlight search is on par with full system search in GNOME and KDE. The menu bar search in the help menu is a hidden gem as well. Perfect for learning new apps and commands. Like, look at this. I just type what I want and it tells me where it is. If only we had something similar. Oh, wait, Unity had that a while back before they ditched that desktop. The absence of a three-finger tap or click for opening or closing tabs was a letdown considering middle click works with a mouse, just not with the touchpad. And you also don't have the middle click to paste feature that Linux has, which is insanely useful and that I missed dearly here. Now, into privacy and telemetry, I disabled it all, but given the closed source nature of macOS, there is no real guarantee that it's fully turned off. For a deeper dive into this, check out my video dedicated to privacy on desktop operating systems. And if you're a customization enthusiast, macOS is a hard pass. It's basically use it as is. But that's just the software. I didn't hate it as much as when I gave it a first impressions and a first look, but it definitely felt subpar for productivity. Like not having the ability to put two windows side by side easily or to have just one window tiled to the side and another one floating. Or just having to maximize all windows that then go full screen, hide the menu bar and if you need to drag something from the file manager into this app, it's all a pain. Not being able to quickly create virtual desktops for my apps, it was just subpar and frustrating. Now keyboard shortcuts can help with that. But honestly, if your operating system needs shortcuts to be usable, then it is not usable. Now let's talk about the Apple ecosystem. Now, I should clarify, I am not exactly the typical Apple ecosystem user. While I do own an iPhone, I don't use iCloud services at all. My tech life revolves around my self-hosted Nextcloud server. It takes care of everything. Cloud storage, contacts, calendars, notes, photos, even RSS feeds. My email is self-hosted too on my own domain. So I have no use for any of Apple's services. So the much touted integration between the iPhone and the Mac is virtually non-existent for me. Sure, Apple's continuity features are great. They let you resume work on your Mac that you started on an iPhone. But for me, it just didn't fit into my workflow. If I'm in range of my computer, I'll work on my computer and I'm not picking up my phone to finish that work afterwards. And taking calls on the Mac, I can see how some might appreciate it, but for a guy who prefers text over unplanned calls, it's pretty redundant. Now, if you're heavily invested into Apple's ecosystem and iCloud, then sure, I can see the benefits, but also bear in mind the privacy implications of using iCloud services. For those on the Linux side, there's also a perfect equivalent. KDE Connect and JS Connect offer many similar features, especially for Android users. In fact, they often go beyond what Apple offers, minus the continuity aspect, of course. Although you can share your clipboard between your phone and computer, for example. So yeah, I am not the target for this feature. And of course, that's just my opinion. I'm just not the typical Apple user. I'm not an Apple user, usually at all, apart from my iPhone. But if you do make use of these features, then great. Now, let's move on to the hardware because this is where this MacBook Pro sort of worked for me. Frankly, there's very little that I can fault this MacBook Pro for in terms of hardware. 
Its display is brilliant, high res, color accurate and sporting a high refresh rate. The downside? That screen comes with super reflective glass. Forget using it comfortably in direct sunlight without cranking up the brightness. And the infamous notch? Well, it was just a temporary distraction at worst. I got used to it in 5 minutes and never noticed it ever again. Does it need to be there? No. Is it a problem? No. The keyboard is a joy to type on once you get accustomed to it. Though the lack of a numpad on such a large laptop is a disappointment. I'm French, I need to press the shift key and a number key to get an actual number, so a numpad is just way too useful. Now I actually kind of enjoyed the Mac layout for a keyboard because I'm not a developer, but for developers, figuring out how to type a pipe or brackets can be a bit of a problem. Now, the webcam, mic and speakers are top tier. This put my Linux devices to shame. I can actually record something on this device without feeling like it's my first YouTube video ever. Despite this, I still found myself gravitating back towards my Slimbook Executive 16 running Linux time and again. Yes, the MacBook Pro has superior build quality, but it's also very heavy. It weighs 2.1 kilos. It's like carrying a laptop and a Steam Deck at the same time. And let's talk about ports. The Mac mostly has USB-C and Thunderbolt ports. Cool, it's futuristic. It's also not very usable for me. Most of what I want to plug in is USB-A. I need a dongle for that. It sucks. Sure, Thunderbolt charging and connectivity are cool, but my usual laptop sports are a lot more practical. And then there's the MacBook's trackpad. It's huge, it's precise, it is gesture friendly, it is great. But the lack of a satisfying physical click falls short of the tactile feedback I get from my Slimbook's trackpad. The fake click just feels like it's vibrating, which is exactly what it's doing. But it doesn't feel like a click, it's weird. So while Apple's hardware is impressive in the build quality, speakers, mic, touchpad, it's generally an all-rounder, really good at everything, I still find myself preferring my Slimbook Executive 16. Because it's lighter, the screen isn't as reflective, I prefer the touchpad, and I have a numpad on it. And of course, that's subjective. A lot of people won't mind the USB-C Thunderbolt ports only, with no USB-A, and some people don't like numpads, so that's gonna be great for them. And let's not forget the beating heart of this machine, the Apple M1 Pro CPU. It is certainly impressive, but the fact that it's ARM-based limits it when running VMs for non-ARM operating systems. This limitation is a huge blow to my workflow as I often need to test different distros in a VM before installing them on actual hardware. Sure, it's doable with QMU, however, neither VirtualBox nor Parallels support ARM-based VMs. And although VirtualBox has a beta for M1, it fails to run anything reliably for me. Not to mention, Parallels is a paid app. Why would I pay for something that Linux can do natively for free? Just based on this limitation only, this M1 Mac could never be my main device, even if I wanted to run a Mac to make this channel, which I absolutely do not. But in terms of performance, this CPU is an absolute monster. On Geekbench, it scores 2038 for single core and an impressive 12636 for multi-core, making it one of the highest scoring laptops I have ever reviewed. What's more, it delivers this performance whether it's plugged in or running on battery. And did I mention the utter silence? The fan never spun up, not even once, even during video editing. Compared to my Slimbook Executive 16, which got 1860 in single core, and 10868 in multi-core with the fan running at full speed and plugged in. On battery, you can halve these scores. And the battery life is absolutely fantastic. I'm getting between 14 to 16 hours of light work and 6 to 8 hours of video editing. That is double what I get on the executive, which manages 7 or 8 hours of light work and about three to four hours of editing. In terms of performance, this thing is an absolute powerhouse and combined with the battery life, this is truly an amazing device. So yeah, these new Macs are 
insane in terms of performance, in terms of build quality. My own preferences still draw me towards the Slimbook Executive 16. I prefer the keyboard, I prefer the numpad, I prefer the touchpad, I prefer the screen. And yes, the performance isn't as good and the battery life definitely isn't as good. But it also weighs a lot less when I carry it around. Despite the excellent build quality and performance of the MacBook, it falls short where it matters most to me. Being able to run a full Linux distro and VMs, something my Executive 16 does seamlessly. So this MacBook will become a very expensive test device for Asahi Linux updates in the future. And for now, it's destined to collect dust in a cupboard. So yeah, you can expect video coverage of Asahi Linux running on this M1 Pro MacBook Pro in the future. But in the meantime, I'm not gonna use it. I would never use macOS anyway. The software is just subpar to everything I need to do and compared to any Linux distro, basically. With poor window management, with frustrating click to focus, an app store that leaves much to be desired, and half-baked features like dock minimization and app maximization, macOS just can't compete with a good Linux desktop, at least for me. In terms of usability, in terms of coherence, in terms of productivity, macOS just does not hold up compared to any modern Linux distro. So yes, the hardware is awesome, but until I can run a full-blown Linux distro on this thing, it's just not for me. But the devices from today's sponsor definitely are for you. If you've ever bought a computer shipping with Windows out of the box and tried to retrofit Linux on it, to notice that, yeah, it doesn't work properly in every single aspect, well, I've got a solution. Click the link in the description below and buy something from Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the components in their devices are picked specifically because they're compatible with Linux and will run super well under Linux. And they have a huge range of devices that will cover every need and every price point, whether you want a laptop, a desktop, something for work, for gaming, workstation, they have it all. They're all super customizable. All the laptops are openable, repairable, and upgradable, and they ship to most countries in the world. So if you want a good Linux experience the next time you purchase a computer, click the link in the description instead. Don't buy something that supports Windows. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to write a comment. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links in the description below to support it from PayPal, LibraPay, Patreon, whatever else, YouTube thanks, YouTube memberships, you know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.